welcome. I'd like to welcome you to this first uh, this first podcast uh, for National Maritime Day Week. I'm Father Sinclair Rube, and with me is Doreen Bada. Uh, she is with the Apostleship of the Sea USA, and also with me is Dave Heindel from the Seafarers International Union, as well as Jerry Pinnell, who is from the American Maritime Officers Association. This uh, podcast that we're doing today and the four other ones that we are going to be doing during Maritime Week is an opportunity for us to focus on the importance of the maritime industry in our local uh, community. And so we celebrate that with us today. Uh, also, I want to thank in a very, very special way the Port of Port Arthur, who has, uh, in fact, been uh, the sponsor of this uh, podcast and all five of these as well as I want to thank our spot, yeah. our supporters. These are different organizations in the maritime community who have uh, volunteered to promote within their membership the participation in these podcasts. So in a special way, I want to thank the Nautical Institute, uh, Houston Gulf Branch, the Council of American Master Mariners, both the Texas Maritime Academy uh, a Council as well as the Houston Council. I want to thank the Propeller Club of the Sabine and Natchez River, the Wright Ships, Apostleship of the Sea, Diocese of Beaumont, as well as Apostleship of the Sea USA, and also the Welsh Gulf Maritime Association. So today with me is uh, both Dave Heindel, who is with the Seafarers International Union, and he heads up the Seafarers section of the International Transport Workers Federation, as well as uh, Jerry Pinnell, who is with the American Maritime Officers, as and it heads up the uh, Star Center in Dania, Florida, which is a uh, officer's training facility. So, uh, Dave, let me uh, start with you and tell me something about the uh, Seafarers International Union and your position in it, as well as uh, what do you do with the, what do you do with the ITF? Uh, thanks, Father. Um, yeah, my uh, my union represents basically unlicensed off uh, unlicensed ratings on board uh, American flag ships. Um, we not only uh, represent uh, the crew on board uh, the vessels uh, under the U.S. flag, but we also train um, all of our mariners in our uh, homegrown school, if you will, uh, the Harry Lundenberg School or the Paul the Paul Hall Center. Um, my job with the organization uh, is the secretary treasurer, basically look after the finances of the organization. But uh, as we all know in labor. Uh, we wear many hats. Um, not only do I do the uh, finances of the organization, but I also represent the seafarers on the international level with the international transport workers. I'm currently the uh, chairman of the seafarer section for the ITF, and uh, we engage uh, over 200 uh, seafarers unions from around the world, and we set policy um, and uh, decide uh, basically what uh, uh, seafarers will work for as far as uh, remunerations, as well as uh, set policy for uh, working um, uh, work rules. And we negotiate with international ship, uh, ship managers, ship owners uh, throughout the world and uh, make sure that seafarers are covered um, on a global scale. Um, and uh, there's many other there's many other activities that uh, that we do in the ITF, but in a nutshell, that's pretty much uh, what our activities are um, on the ITF side. So, Dave, you talk about uh, U.S. seafarers, uh, unlicensed seafarers. Uh, who are they? What kind of ships are they on? How many you got? Um, under the U.S. flag, we probably have oh, geez, uh, 400, possibly 400. That's both domestic as well as uh, about a. Um, a hundred of those, just under a hundred of those are internationally traded vessels. Um, we have ships that are container lines, tankers, car carriers, bulk carriers, tugs, dredges. Um, it's all the whole host of maritime activity uh, is covered by our by our union. Um, we have uh, um, a number of um, well, a number of deep sea ships. Primarily, that's uh, that's our bread and butter. If uh, if I could uh, use that uh, that term, the deep sea ships are, are really what keep uh, the engine going in the SIU. We have a lot of tugs and a lot of dredges, but uh, primarily it's a deep sea mariner. 
that uh, we look out after on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, uh, as I said, we train them, we give them all of the basic training when they come into the industry uh, and all of their upgrading uh, skills that they, are, that they need uh, to uh, advance in the maritime industry. Um, and uh, when they decide to call it quits, the union provides them uh, with a pretty decent pension uh, when they decide to pack it in. Jerry, so uh, first, what is your own career? Because uh, you came up, you went through the academy and sailed for a number of years, and now you're with the AMO. I did. Thank you. Uh, good to see you, Father. Dave, Doreen, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I uh, uh, came out of uh, SUNY Maritime College, uh, sailed, worked my way up, uh, had the uh, opportunity to sail master at a relatively young age, and uh, had uh, 10 years as master. and. Uh, Came ashore back in uh, 2007 uh, as the director of member training and now the director of training for American Maritime Officers. Uh, in that capacity, I'm responsible to our 3,000 plus members, um, both deck and engine uh, officers, making sure that their training uh, remains uh, regulatory compliant and that we are able to meet their professional and development needs for the types and sectors that we crew. Mm -hmm. So tell me what's going on at the Star Center over there. What do you when you say you're doing training? What's going on? So uh, everything from uh, uh, keeping their credential valid uh, and renewing that credential through their upgrade training from uh, a uh, entry level officer or in some cases uh, ratings all the way through to their uh, unlimited tonnage uh, licensure, um, master chief engineer. Uh, and also any of the the specific sector training they may need, for instance, uh, tankerman training, uh, uh, low flash point fuel or uh, gas training for those vessels that now operate using uh, liquid natural gas and uh, things like dynamic positioning training for our officers on the cable layers and uh, uh, vessels that use dynamic positioning systems uh, in their propulsion modes. So right now, do you do, are your guys doing a lot of work? Or are they sitting on the beach? Or are they having trouble transferring from ships back to shore? Or well, uh, right I now? think uh, everyone is is feeling the impact of this pandemic. Uh, you know, crew changes are um, you know they're happening sporadically, but we're still trying to get those mariners um, the training they need so that they can keep their credential renewed. In this time, uh, at the current time, we are uh, gearing for a phased reopening at Star Center starting in uh, the next couple of weeks so that we can make sure that people continue to have the ability to keep their credential current. That's the most important thing. Even though the Coast Guard has provided some relief to us, um, they have not gone past uh, the October time frame currently. So we still have members who are either looking to get on a vessel that will be on a vessel after the um, uh, expiration of their the, the relief that the Coast Guard has provided. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we have an opportunity for them to keep their credential current, which allows them to continue to be employed and uh, eventually continue on their career path with additional training they're going to need to, to increase their license or um, uh, move on to other different vessels and sectors. Yeah, you, you mentioned that because personally, I've got to renew my my medical certificate, my STCW medical certificate. Yes. And the challenge that I run into is first, uh, can I go to Tower Medical and are they doing the certificates? And second, since it's a Coast Guard uh, uh, medical certificate, is anybody in West Virginia still processing this type of stuff? And it's a big problem. Big, it's a question. I'm going to have to go check that out soon. But are the guys running into problems as far as completing tests or examinations or getting paperwork back? Well, right now the regional exam centers uh, are not testing. Uh, the paperwork can be submitted and I believe they have a limited staff at National Maritime Center, some working remotely, some uh, in the office to process renewals. Uh, the Anybody who needs to test for an upgrade unfortunately doesn't have the ability because the regional exam centers aren't doing that testing. So the system is, is uh, uh, slow for renewals, but they're still happening. But with regards to upgrade training, uh, all of that's come to a halt. Yep. Dave, I was talking to uh, Mike Russo the other day at the Houston Hall, and he was saying that, that they were incredibly busy 
uh, processing people for relief as, as far as on the Jones Act domestic trade. Uh, where, how has it been for the Seafarers Union and the, and the SIU guys, both uh, domestically and even the, uh, the feeder service in, like in Asia? Yeah, well, obviously it's been pretty, uh, pretty tight uh, with crew changes up until the 1st of May. Uh, there was a period of just about two months where all reliefs were pretty much stopped except for perhaps emergency uh, arrangements and that sort of thing. But uh, come May 1st, we um, had uh, made an arrangement with the uh, ship owners and the ship managers uh, to start um, making crew changes again. So that has been going on. Prior, prior to May 1st, we, we generally ship about 1,200 seafarers every month on, on an average uh, is, is what, uh, what we figure. And during the uh, first two months, we were shipping, um, the first month was pretty much just emergency, so it was very few. The second month, I think we um, shipped about 200 uh, during the month of, um, month of March. It went up to 400 in April. Come May 1st, uh, we're still waiting for, the, for those numbers to come in, but I would think we'd be somewhere near uh, 800. Uh, as the numbers that were quoted to me, around 800 seafarers. So it's been it's been pretty slow, but it is breaking. Uh, fortunately, uh, the seafarers that have extended their uh, contracts or extended their stay on board are starting to get relieved, and the seafarers who have been unemployed waiting to get back uh, are starting to make their way back to the vessel. So we are starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel, um, and actually it's been working out pretty good for the last, uh, well, week plus uh, at, uh, since the 1st of May, but um, it's, it's been pretty hectic. Um, you know, crews that, uh, American crews that are in U.S. ports, they've uh, been restricted uh, to the vessel um, with no shore leave, and that's either because it was state imposed or um, we, in some cases, in most cases, uh, because nobody really knew what this virus was actually, what, what it really meant to any of us, the best thing to do is just keep everybody on board. We agreed with the ship owners, so let's just stay stay put. And uh, of course, the seafarers were okay with it the first month. After the second month, people started to get a little restless, especially if they were like in, say, the port of Jacksonville, and their wife was, uh, you know, wife was on the dock waving to them, um, and they couldn't get ashore. So it was, it was uh, after the first month, it became frustrating for the seafarers to be able to be right in their home port but not be able to go ashore. So uh, the um, ship owners um, agreed with us that it was time to start opening up uh, the doors. The problem, the problem is, is of course, we still really don't know the full impact of this virus, but um, the key now is we have protocols in place. We understand it a little better, but uh, because of uh, uh, the negotiations that have been going on between the unions and, and the AMA, as we call them, the American Maritime Associations, uh, we've managed to reach an understanding on protocols and how we're gonna deal with uh, cases, as well as how we're gonna deal with seafarers that are just coming to the ship, as well as uh, seafarers that are going home. It's been pretty pretty hectic on the American side, uh, but the, the real challenge uh, is on the foreign side, which, uh, I can get into uh, a bit more if you want, but you know, in, in the U.S., our seafarers work uh, two months, uh, four months on, two off, four months on, four months off. Um, it's not that not that difficult. On the foreign side, it's a completely different kettle of fish. If, if, if translates. Uh, how has the uh, the pandemic and the quarantines affected your guys? So uh, much the same way we sail, uh, we, we serve side by side with the SIU and the same issues they're dealing with. We are dealing with the exact same, uh, you know, obviously some of the remote locations are difficult to get crews to. But again, as uh, Dave alluded to, there's uh, there's now uh, uh, both company specific and general industry protocols in place that are facilitating uh, the movement of the seafarers to the vessels. And I think that's that's going to uh, free the log jam up a little bit as we go forward. Now, for both of you guys, just in the regular world and not this world, the, the January, February world, uh, and once things get somewhat normalized again, 
are there jobs in the industry that are waiting for people to come in or or are y'all full pretty much at full employment in the sense of having mariners to crew the ships i'll take the first shot uh jerry um on on the unlicensed side it, it's a little different on on uh, the ratings versus the uh, the licensed guys uh we are constantly recruiting or have been recruiting up until uh, the last couple of months of course um but uh, there are always there's always a need for more mariners um on the the rating side we still have um maybe 20 uh ra um apprentices in a the school they have chosen to stay and of course the school has been shut down for two months now but the the apprentices that were there chose to stay so they can complete their training and uh be obviously uh, deployed uh, to to a ship um as soon as uh, the all clear is given and uh, my understanding is that some of them are being actually placed out as apprentices on board some of the ships but um, there's definitely a need for for mariners under the u.s flag on the license side i'll let jerry pick it up but it's a bit more difficult much more training and requirements that are uh, needed for uh, to become an officer so thank you dave uh the 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 officers uh we continue to fill positions with new people coming in but uh certainly less frequently than we were in the past uh knowing that every every year we have uh 1200 plus new officers coming out of the academies that are all eager and looking for jobs and uh uh you know unfortunately i think this year it's going to be a, a tough road for them getting their first jobs out of the uh out of out of school or uh if they are uh, uh lucky enough to have completed all their training and and uh are part of an apprentice program let's say uh they may have a little bit better shot uh the the apprentice programs have some pipelines that work uh and facilitate those that employment a little bit better uh, but there there are opportunities uh i'll be the few and far between but they are there but as far as what i've read in the past so is that we've got plenty of like third mates and third engineers but when you start talking about seconds and chiefs and uh, engineers as well as, as chief mates, then the pickings gets pretty short at that point because people sort of rotate out the first couple, three, four years. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, statistically, we have some numbers that let us know uh, after the first five years of everybody who comes in who's still with us. Uh, and that's a relatively low percentage point. And then when you get to the 10 year mark, how many are left there and how many? Uh, you know, as they get into uh, uh, the latter parts of their their career, how many choose to stay and and work through that? And yes, you see this this bimodal distribution of of uh, where we have people and where the gaps are in that. Somewhere in the you know 35 year old range, 35 to 45 year old range, where these these mariners are now. Um, uh, pursuing other other life interests and starting their families. So we start to see that drop off. Uh, and, you know, it's it's a matter of how you fill those gaps and continue to meet them long term. Things like um, uh, the military to mariner initiatives and, and some of the things we can do to help bring mariners, seasoned mariners in at certain age areas uh, that allow us to fill those gaps. So Dave, uh, I just want to touch upon, I know that being a personally being a member of the Seafarers International Union, I took a great deal of pride in seeing that the hospital ships Mercy and Comfort were pulled out by President Trump and used to as adjuncts or uh, medical aid uh, on, on both sides of the port. So we've also seen this before, but this is something that we could take a great deal of pride in as U.S. merchant mariners that when our country was in need in that situation, uh, we had mariners ready to go out there. Yeah, it was quite amazing to see those ships uh, enter the port, especially the port of New York. Uh, it was it was almost like it was a, a new ship that was being christened uh, with people along the waterfront uh, waving it on. You know, she was coming up uh, the the river. But um, the work that they did is in such a short period. I think it might have been there for what maybe a month. Uh, it was up in New York. The work that they did uh, was uh, uh, nothing short of, of brilliant. They they did not have, uh, I think they started out, it was not to be used for uh, COVID patients. It was more for uh, relieving the, the normal hospitals 
of uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, either operations or uh, treatments. Um, and I think eventually it did become um, an operation for some COVID patients. But uh, once the um, hospitals had some relief on, you know, in, in their bed counts, um, there was not much of a need uh, to keep the vessel there um, any longer. So I believe she is going up. I'm not sure of the mercy to be quite honest with you, but having those two hospital ships is uh, fantastic uh, to know that America, if it's needed, that they can be deployed in a matter of uh, hours, if you will, uh, to a particular port, whether it's in the U.S. or elsewhere. But uh, to have those vessels uh, is, is nothing short of amazing. And the people that are on there, all the professionals that, that are on there, not just, not just the seafarers that are operating the vessel, but uh, the number of doctors and nurses uh, and all the professional people on there uh, that can be called in a matter of a few hours and get on the way is, is nothing short of amazing. Um, well, this, this allows I'm very lucky that we have them. There's and this good... allows me to sort of segue at this point about, uh, about the reality that, and we see this all the time, we, we saw that, uh, with after Hurricane Marie, and we were sending ready reserve fleets ships down to Puerto Rico to supply aid there. We've had that here in our local community uh, with uh, the Hurricane Ike and Hurricane Rita that we had the gray ships, were, which we used to store uh, first responder equipment so that once the uh, storm, the hurricane passed, they were there. And, and the, the need to call up these vessels quickly, which brings us to the question of Jones Act, whenever I reading articles about this antiquated 100-year-old law that exists out there that, that we just need to let Chinese run all our ships up and down the Mississippi River, that that would be a good idea for us. But if that was the situation, we would not have had the crew members to uh, activate the mercy and the comfort in that 10 days, two weeks or so that it happened at that point. Yeah, well, it's vital that uh, certainly for America, it's vital to maintain a pool of trained, qualified mariners to operate uh, vessels, not only in the commercial sector, but also to have them ready should the military need uh, to call them out. And we can um, raise uh, again and again the issue of World War II and the uh, impact that merchant mariners played there. Nothing much has changed in that regard. If you're talking about moving uh, massive, uh, whether it's military equipment or relief equipment uh, to a particular area, you want to make sure that the people that are on there are going to, uh, are obviously going to provide the service that you need as, as either a government or a military officer, that uh, those people on there are trusted and um, they can deliver the goods. If you have to count on someone else, if we were to allow or open up the Jones Act and allow foreign flags to come in here, it's just going to be a matter of time before there are no American mariners because you, you can't compete with uh, the Chinese or the Filipinos. Uh, and God bless them all, a seafarer is a seafarer, but the fact the fact is, is that um, we could not compete if we had to compete against the Chinese seafarer. I think a Chinese seafarer is lucky to make $650 uh, per month, and that's uh, um, probably a very high paid Chinese seafarer, but that's the ILO minimum. And uh, for us to compete with that, I think we could probably, on the US side, we could work for absolutely nothing and uh, we'd still be much more expensive because of the taxes and the regulations that uh, ship owners have to comply with. But, uh, you know, as far as having the manpower pool uh, for the US military, as well as the US government in times of crisis, um, you're not going to you're not going to beat having a U.S. mariner available uh, to operate those ships. And uh, it's been a policy of the U.S. government for um, many, many years, uh, certainly 100 years now with the Jones Act uh, um, be, becoming a, 100 years old, that it's been a policy that we support a U.S. merchant fleet. And we need to continue to, to have that fleet in order to assure uh, the U.S. national security and national uh, interest. You, you, you mentioned the uh, Second World War and, and being from Port Arthur, that's a, an important point for us because we literally had thousands of folks from Southeast Texas that crewed 
through the National Maritime Union and somewhat through the Seafarers International Union, crewed up the, the pure oil tankers, crewed up the uh, Gulf tankers, the Texaco tankers, and, and moved them throughout that world. But there's also another piece about how unprepared we were at the First World War because we depended, we didn't have the Jones Act and we depended upon British shipping. And when all of a sudden British shipping got tied up with the German war, that that German, that British shipping disappeared and we had to not have the capacity to move our products. One of the piece of legislation from the First World War was actually a building program and expansion of the Virgin Marine to respond to that. Jerry, uh, as far as your union goes, uh, what, what's y'all's position with the Jones Act? Obviously, we support it 100%. Uh, uh, without it, uh, we would see the need for U.S. seafarers dwindle down to uh, potentially uh, none at all. So uh, it's it's our lifeblood. It's what we rely on, um, and uh, you know we fully support uh, not only the Jones Act but maritime security program and, and any uh, any initiative that we can have to uh, increase the amount of uh, vessels. Uh, which will in turn increase the number of mariners who are available not only to cruise those ships, but in a uh, national emergency. Um, you know, it's always inspiring to see people who may have just um, walked off of a four month hitch or, or uh, even longer. Uh, and when the flag goes up and we need them, they always respond. They always uh, come through and they always deliver the goods. You, mean, you mentioned that because uh Port Arthur, uh, Beaumont area has one of our three national maritime uh, maritime administration reserve fleets. And in 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, it was like yank all these old uh, steam powered gray ships out. And we literally had 65, 70 year old, 75 year old uh, engineers and uh, uh, ABs pulling out their old uh, Z cards, because that's what it was at that time, to go and man these ships. And uh, I, I think if we really got into a serious situation, we would be looking a whole lot like that. I mean, when you have to dig out a 62-year-old priest and put him on board the ship to be your bosun, oh, God help us all in that situation. <laughs> hey, don't, don't discriminate against 62-year-old men, please. <laughs> I would just add, actually, if you look at the uh, flag behind us here, the American Merchant Marine Veterans flag, that actually came from Jeff Riley, who had uh, the first seafarer center here in Port Arthur, which was the Folksal Club, uh, an Irish bar. But he was a, a very proud U.S. Mer merchant mariner, and um, that flag hung all the time in the in the foyer of the the uh, Folksal Club. And when he passed away, his family had that frame for us and put in, into this place as he was one of our founders uh, here at the Seafarer Center. Yeah, he also he was also one of those 70 year old guys that that got on the gray ship and sailed to Kuwait and was out there for about six, eight months. Uh, bad back, bad knees and bad attitude. <laughs> <laughs> but that was regular. Uh, but it, it sort of speaks of the, of the history that, that's there. Uh, we're, we're winding down, but Dave, you know, I wanted to come back to you because because as the head of the seafarer section of the ITF, uh, we've we've focused on the Jones Act and the importance of that in our in our nation and the jobs and the employments that are there. But but we have 1.5 million seafarers that are sailing throughout the world, and this is a giant problem for crew change, for getting to airports for all those types of things. And it, we were already becoming aware of the mental health issues that were growing among seafarers. Uh, we had a young Indian cadet who committed suicide in the, in the Pacific, but Port Natchez locally was our first port of call for that ship so that the police and everybody investigated it there. And I was engaged in, in visiting with the crew and things like that on the, on the ship during that time. But this is a major hardship for both sides, for those who are on the ship, but also for those who need to go back to work to make money for their family who can't get to the ship. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a very tough road. Listen, I, we on the American side, our guys sacrifice quite a bit uh, to stay on board, whether it's uh, the restriction being restricted uh, to the vessel or had to stay on past their uh, allotted time or their, their, their uh, normal crew change rotation. But on the foreign side, um, those seafarers generally um, work between eight to 10 months per year. 
and they work solid eight months straight. And at the end of their contract, uh, they're generally sent home on a, in normal times. They're normally sent home and another seafarer from the Philippines or India, wherever the crews are coming from, um, are, are sent to relieve them. Um, since the pandemic started uh, early March, of course, everything shut down. Government started uh, closing their borders and restricting people and um, requiring seafarers to basically stay on board uh, the vessel beyond the eight months. Some of them may have had, uh, on, in the international side, you could stay either eight months, nine months is a normal rotation, plus or minus one. So you could stay on as much as 11 months um, on board a vessel without uh, um, without being able to get off the vessel. Um, under international regulations, you can't stay more than 12 months. Um, and because of the pandemic uh, happening, and it started in March, basically a lot of these seafarers who, who were due to get off that had uh, eight, nine, 10, or 11 months on board a vessel, uh, they were required to stay on. A lot of them, most all of them are still on board vessels. So a lot of them have uh, 12 months and some up to 15 months on board some of the vessels at this point uh, because uh, national governments have closed the borders. The airline industry is pretty much shut down for international flights. And uh, it, it's been a very tough road. The communications, uh, um, you know, if they are in a port where they either have cell phone service or the ship owner provides uh, access to um, their bandwidth to allow them to either email or talk to their people through Skype or one of those uh, uh, services. Um, they've been able to communicate a little bit, but the fact the fact that they're on there for 12 to 15 months on board of a ship, not knowing really what's going on for real back home, uh, is is trying. And the the problem is, it doesn't look like it's going to let up let up anytime soon. We have uh, actually on the international side uh, have been working very well uh, between the ship owners organizations as well as uh, the ITF. The UN agencies, the IMO, the ILO, the WHO, uh, IMHA, the, all of the organizations, either UN agency or uh, shipping, uh, uh, shipping representatives as well as the labor representatives, have worked very well and very hard to try to get the pump prime to start allowing crew changes again. But every time uh, we, we think we get somewhere, um, the... Uh, the rules change. The goalpost basically gets moved a little further away, and uh, it's been a struggle. Um, we have managed to just uh, in the last week managed to come up with a 12-point plan uh, for governments that uh, will hopefully ease some of the restrictions that that are that exist today. Um, the 12-point plan was drafted between the ITF and the Chamber of Shipping. And uh, we sent it over to the IMO and the ILO. Both have signed off on it and sent. they sent it out to their uh, member states as guidance on how they could continue um, to expect that seafarers uh, coming off the vessel or passing through their country uh, to join a vessel uh, would be um, clean or um, not have any worries about them spreading the virus coming from some other country. Um, the protocols are as strict as they can be without uh, uh, without testing. Testing is a whole nother, nother animal, but uh, to make sure that seafarers uh, lock themselves down for 14 days, whether it's in their home country or before, you know, if they come to say the United States, they locked up into a hotel for 14 days before they join the vessel. And uh, the, the protocols are such that uh, it allows the industry to be able to continue to operate while giving governments some assurances. And we're basically uh, expecting governments to start um, putting policies and procedures in place to allow that to happen. Should they fall short uh, and continue to um, have strict rules on, and uh, continue uh, not having flights available and not allowing flights to come in, then obviously it's gonna cause more um, problems for the maritime industry, not only not only for the seafarers, but in general for, for the industry. Because if, if you have a seafarer that is not um, 
if, if he's fatigued, he's been on there for so long, he has to get off that vessel. You got to have a fresh body that has that comes on board and picks up the duties, so that vessel can operate in a safe environment. One uh, for the seafarers themselves, as well as for for the shipping company who has invested millions of dollars in a piece of equipment. Um, he wants to have the best qualified crew that he could possibly have on board that vessel. And uh, you have environmental issues that you have to be concerned with, that uh, if seafarers are not up to par and all they're worried about is getting home, then uh, that, that can cause a lot of problems. And uh, we think that we have given the governments the uh, security that they need to assure that seafarers, when they come either leave the vessel or join a vessel, that when they pass through their country, that uh, they can be assured that they're not going to be spreading uh, the virus. It's not a hundred percent, but it's certainly better than what we have today. And the important piece of this is, is we have all um, basically come to rely on the global supply chain as we know it. And when you walk into uh, a Target store, if you're walking into a particular store and you're looking for a product, generally um, 90% of the products that you see on the store shelves are brought by ship. And if that supply chain was to become interrupted, well, those those stores uh, will no longer have the product on uh, on the shelves. So it's important that <laughs> we continue to keep that supply chain going. And at some point, if things don't change for the seafarers, then that supply chain will break down. And if it breaks down, it's gonna be harder to get that pump prime, uh, that pump prime uh, than it would be today if we can just get the crews off the vessel who need to go home and get fresh bodies on board. Not only just for the safety of, uh, of, the, of the seafarers, but those seafarers that uh, are home and expect to go out on board ship that provide for, as you know, Filipinos, they generally work for, um, eight to 10 months and they're taking care of uh, a number of different families. Um, you know, the mother, the father, the father-in-law, the mother-in-law, as well as uh, all of all of their kids. When they work, they're providing for a lot of people. So without, without having uh, the availability of getting out and going to work on board of a ship, um, societies start breaking down. And uh, there is, there's a lot at stake here. And I can tell you that uh, the seafarers are starting to get frustrated out on the ships. They can, they know that uh, where the breakdown is, and the breakdown is the governments, and they're starting to act out. I mentioned uh, to you before before this call that uh, a few seafarers have committed suicide just in the last few days, um, and that's going to grow. We've had a, an incident. I don't know if you heard about it. There was a, an Indian master that actually redirected a ship. And he says, I can get off in India. We're going to redirect the ship. I'm going to get off in India and go on about my business. Now, that's obviously a very drastic measure for a captain to take. But that's what is happening out uh, on the waters today is people are starting to take drastic measures because they feel hopeless. There's no and they don't see that maybe in a month's time, things are going to be different. A month ago or two months ago, they may have had that 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 view. But at this point, uh they're starting to feel hopeless that uh, this is never going to end. And uh, it's unfortunate, but comparing a foreign seafarer to a U.S. seafarer, it's night and day. I mean, we, we don't have any problems uh, on the U.S. side as compared to the international uh, registries that, that exist out there. And uh, I, I will say that we've worked very well with uh, the international ship owners. They, they understand uh, the dynamic that is taking place out there, and they know that their vessels are not going to be seaworthy um, if they're unable to start making these screw changes. Yep. Uh, Jerry, the, that he brings uh, Dave brings up a really important point. I just want to bring you in at the very end at the to give you a last sort of the final say. But but we've got this whole situation of of uh, people sort of look at seafarers and they ask, why are you here? I remember there was a maritime accident in San Francisco Bay and a woman was reported on TV walking her dog and and her response was, why is that ship here? And there seems to be this disconnection between our personal lives and that ship that is there. And even living in Port Arthur, we encounter so many people who, who act as if we're living in Colorado because why is that ship here? Well, in general, the, the, the public doesn't fully appreciate what the maritime industry does and how we support 
uh, every facet of their their normal life, from the the, the fuel they put in their car to the uh, household goods that they go to their their local store and and procure. Uh, all of that, uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, uh, 95 percent comes in on ships and. Uh, there needs to be a better awareness of our industry, what we do for uh, not only everyday uh, uh, Americans, but also for, for the nation as a whole, from the security aspect uh, 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 all the way through to uh, uh, making sure that the, the, there's a steady supply of fuel, the support we give in national emergencies, the relief we provide, uh, all of that is based on uh, seafarers, the availability of seafarers, well-trained uh, and, and employed seafarers. Well, Dave, Jerry, thanks so much for being with us in this fourth podcast of our National Maritime Week observance. We couldn't do our usual thing, which was at the sundial here in Port Arthur and then to lay a wreath in the intercoastal canal, but we've decided to do these five, five podcasts. We really appreciate you guys being with us. Uh, before you go, I wanted to, I do want to thank again our sponsor, the Port of Port Arthur, who has made this possible, as well as our supporters, which is the Nautical Institute, the Council of American Master Mariners, the Propeller Club of the Spine and Nature's River, Wright Ships, the Apostleship of the Sea, both of the Diocese of Beaumont, as well as the Apostleship of the Sea of the United States of America and West Gulf Maritime Association. Uh, Dave, and you're, the and, Port Arthur International Sea Fair. And the Port Arthur International Sea Fair Center. I forgot to write them down here, even though we're in their building right now. So uh, thanks, Dave uh, and Jerry, for the great work that you guys do. Keep uh, keep the fight up and taking care of both our promoting the Jones Act and our U.S. flag vessels, as well as uh, taking care of our, the one and a half million foreign flag uh, foreign seafarers who are working on uh, different uh, deep sea vessels throughout the world. God bless, and uh, see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.